This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapters 28 through 30. Chapter 28 Black Sunday. In March of the year of grace, 1918, there was one week into which must have crowded more of searing human agony than any seven days had ever held before in the history of the world. And in that week, there was one day when all humanity seemed nailed to the cross. On that day the whole planet must have been a groan with universal convulsion. Everywhere the hearts of men were failing them for fear. It dawned calmly and coldly and grayly at Ingleside. Mrs. Blythe and Rilla and Miss Oliver made ready for church in a suspense tempered by hope and confidence. The doctor was away, having been summoned during the wee smiles to the Marwood household in Upper Glen, where a little war-bride was fighting gallantly on her own battleground to give life, not death, to the world. Susan announced that she meant to stay home that morning, a rare decision for Susan. "'But I would rather not go to church this morning, Mrs. Dr. dear,' she explained. If Whiskers on the Moon were there, and I saw him looking holy and pleased, as he always looks when he thinks the Huns are winning, I fear I would lose my patience and my sense of decorum and hurl a Bible or hymn-book at him, thereby disgracing myself and the sacred edifice. No, Mrs. Dr. dear, I shall stay home from church till the tide turns and pray hard here. I think I might as well stay home, too, for all the good church will do me today, Miss Oliver said to Rilla, as they walked down the hard-frozen red road to the church. I can think of nothing but the question, does the line still hold? Next Sunday will be Easter, said Rilla. Will it herald death or life to our cause? Mr. Meredith preached that morning from the text, He that endureth to the end shall be saved, and hope and confidence rang through his inspiring sentences. Rilla, looking up at the memorial tablet on the wall above their pew, sacred to the memory of Walter Cuthbert Blythe, felt herself lifted out of her dread, and filled anew with courage. Walter could not have laid down his life for naught. His had been the gift of prophetic vision, and he had foreseen victory. She would cling to that belief. The line would hold. In this renewed mood she walked home from church almost gaily. The others, too, were hopeful, and all went smiling into Ingleside. There was no one in the living room save Jims, who had fallen asleep on the sofa, and Doc, who sat hushed in grim repose on the hearthrug, looking very hideish indeed. No one was in the dining-room either and stranger still, no dinner was on the table, which was not even set. Where was Susan? "'Can she have taken ill?' exclaimed Mrs. Blythe anxiously. "'I thought it strange that she did not want to go to church this morning.' The kitchen door opened, and Susan appeared on the threshold with such a ghastly face that Mrs. Blythe cried out in sudden panic, "'Susan, what is it?' "'The British line is broken, and the German shells are falling on Paris,' said Susan dully. The three women stared at each other, stricken. "'It's not true. It's not.' gasped Rilla. "'The thing would be ridiculous,' said Gertrude Oliver, and then she laughed horribly. "'Susan, who told you this? When did the news come?' asked Mrs. Blythe. "'I got it over the long-distance phone from Charlottetown half an hour ago,' said Susan. "'The news came to town late last night. It was Dr. Holland phoned it out, and he said it was only too true. Since then I have done nothing, Mrs. Dr. dear. I am very sorry dinner is not ready. It is the first time I have been so remiss.' If you will be patient, I will soon have something for you to eat. But I am afraid I let the potatoes burn. Dinner? Nobody wants any dinner, Susan, said Mrs. Blythe wildly. Oh, this thing is unbelievable. It must be a nightmare. Paris is lost. France is lost. The war is lost, gasped Perilla, amid the utter ruins of hope and confidence and belief. Oh, God, oh, God, moaned Gertrude Oliver, walking about the room and wringing her hands. Oh, God! Nothing else. No other words, nothing but that age-old plea, the old, old cry of supreme agony and appeal, from the human heart whose every human staff has failed it. "'Is God dead?' asked a startled little voice from the doorway of the living room. Jim stood there, flushed from sleep, his big brown eyes filled with dread. "'Oh, Willa! Oh, Willa! Is God dead?' Miss Oliver stopped walking and exclaiming, and stared at Jim's, in whose eyes tears of fright were beginning to gather. Rilla ran to his comforting, while Susan bounded up from the chair upon which she had dropped. "'No,' she said briskly, with a sudden return of her real self. "'No, God isn't dead, nor Lloyd George either. We were forgetting that, Mrs. Dr. dear. Don't cry, little Kitchener. Bad as things are, they might be worse. The British line may have broken, but the British Navy is not. Let us tie to that. 
I will take a brace and get up a bite to eat, for strength we must have. They made a pretense of eating Susan's bite, but it was only a pretense. Nobody at Ingleside ever forgot that black afternoon. Gertrude Oliver walked the floor. They all walked the floor, except Susan, who got out her grey war sock. Mrs. Dr. dear, I must knit on Sunday at last. I have never dreamed of doing it before, for say what might be said, I have considered it was a violation of the third commandment. But whether it is or whether it is not, I must knit today or I shall go mad. Knit if you can, Susan, said Mrs. Blythe restlessly. I would knit if I could, but I cannot. I cannot. If we could only get fuller information, moaned Rilla, there might be something to encourage us if we knew all. We know that the Germans are shelling Paris, said Miss Oliver bitterly. In that case they must have smashed through everywhere and be at the very gate. No, we have lost. Let us face the fact as other peoples in the past have had to face it. Other nations, with right on their side, have given their best and bravest, and gone down to defeat in spite of it. Ours is but one more to baffled millions who have gone before. I won't give up like that, cried Willa, her pale face suddenly flushing. I won't despair. We are not conquered. No, if Germany overruns all France, we are not conquered. I am ashamed of myself for this hour of despair. You won't see me slump again like that. I am going to ring up town at once and ask for particulars." But town could not be got. The long-distance operator there was submerged by similar calls from every part of the distracted country. Rilla finally gave up and slipped away to Rainbow Valley. There she knelt down on the withered grey grasses in the little nook where she and Walter had had their last talk together, with her head bowed against the mossy trunk of a fallen tree. The sun had broken through the black clouds and drenched the valley with a pale golden splendour. The bells on the tree-lovers twinkled elfinly and fitfully in the gusty March wind. "'Oh, God, give me strength,' she whispered. "'Just strength and courage.' Then, like a child, she clasped her hands together and said, as simply as Jim's could have done, "'Please send us better news tomorrow.' She knelt there a long time, and when she went back to Ingleside she was calm and resolute. The doctor had arrived home, tired but triumphant, little Douglas Haig Marwood having made a safe landing on the shores of time. Gertrude was still pacing restlessly, but Mrs. Blythe and Susan had reacted from the shock, and Susan was already planning a new line of defence for the Channel ports. "'As long as we can hold them,' she declared, "'the situation is saved. Paris has really no military significance.' "'Don't,' said Gertrude sharply, as if Susan had run something into her. She thought the old worn phrase, no military significance, nothing short of ghastly mockery under the circumstances, and more terrible to endure than the voice of despair would have been. I heard up at Marwood's of the line being broken, said the doctor, but this story of the Germans shelling Paris seems to be rather incredible. Even if they broke through, they were fifty miles from Paris at the nearest point, and how could they get their artillery close enough to shell it in so short a time? Depend upon it, girls, that part of the message can't be true. I'm going to try a long-distance call to town myself. The doctor was no more successful than Rilla had been, but his point of view cheered them all a little, and helped them through the evening. At nine o'clock a long-distance message came through at last that helped them through the night. "'The line broke only in one place before St. Quentin,' said the doctor as he hung up the receiver, "'and the British troops are retreating in good order. That's not so bad. As for the shells that are falling on Paris, they are coming from a distance of seventy miles, from some amazing long-range gun the Germans have invented and sprung with the opening offensive. That is all the news to date, and Dr. Holland says it is reliable.' "'It would have been dreadful news yesterday,' said Gertrude but compared to what we heard this morning it is almost like good news. But still, she added, trying to smile, I am afraid I will not sleep much tonight. There is one thing to be thankful for at any rate, Miss Oliver, dear, said Susan, and that is that Cousin Sophia did not come in today. I really could not have endured her on top of all the rest. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 Wounded and Missing Battered but not broken was the headline in Monday's paper, and Susan repeated it over and over to herself as she went about her work. The gap caused by the St. Quentin disaster had been patched up in time, but the Allied line was being pushed relentlessly back from the territory they had purchased in 1917 with half a million lives. On Wednesday the headline was, British and French Czech Germans, but still the retreat went on. Back and back and back. Where would it end? Would the line break again, this time disastrously? On Saturday the headline was, Even Berlin Admits Offensive Checked, and for the first time in that terrible week the Ingleside folk dare to draw a long breath. Well, we have got one week over. Now for the next, said Susan staunchly. 
"'I feel like a prisoner on the rack when they stop turning it,' Miss Oliver said to Rilla as they went to church on Easter morning. "'But I am not off the rack. The torture may begin again at any time.' "'I doubted God last Sunday,' said Rilla. "'But I don't doubt him today. Evil cannot win. Spirit is on our side, and it is bound to outlast flesh.' Nevertheless, her faith was often tried in the dark spring that followed. Armageddon was not, as they had hoped, a matter of a few days. It stretched out into weeks and months. Again and again Hindenburg struck his savage, sudden blows with alarming though futile success. Again and again the military critics declared the situation extremely perilous. Again and again Cousin Sophia agreed with the military critics. "'If the Allies go back three miles more, the war is lost,' she wailed. "'Is the British Navy anchored in those three miles?' demanded Susan scornfully. "'It is the opinion of a man who knows all about it,' said Cousin Sophia solemnly. "'There is no such person,' retorted Susan. "'As for the military critics, they do not know one blessed thing about it any more than you or I. They have been mistaken times out of number. Why do you always look on the dark side, Sophia Crawford?' "'Because there ain't any bright side, Susan Baker. Oh, is there not?' It is the 20th of April, and Hindi is not in Paris yet, although he said he would be there by April 1st. Is that not a bright spot, at least? It is my opinion that the Germans will be in Paris before very long, and more than that, Susan Baker, they will be in Canada. Not in this part of it. The Huns shall never set foot in Prince Edward Island as long as I can handle a pitchfork, declared Susan, looking and feeling quite equal to routing the entire German army single-handed. "'No, Sophia Crawford. To tell you the plain truth, I am sick and tired of your gloomy predictions. I do not deny that some mistakes have been made. The Germans would never have got back Passchendaele if the Canadians had been left there, and it was bad business trusting to those Portuguese at the Lys River. But that is no reason why you or anyone should go about proclaiming the war is lost. I do not want to quarrel with you, least of all at such a time as this, but our morale must be kept up.' and I am going to speak my mind out plainly, and tell you that if you cannot keep from such croaking, your room is better than your company. Cousin Sophia marched home in high dudgeon to digest her affront, and did not reappear in Susan's kitchen for many weeks. Perhaps it was just as well, for they were hard weeks, when the Germans continued to strike, now here, now there, and seemingly vital points fell to them at every blow. And one day in early May, when wind and sunshine frolicked in Rainbow Valley, and the maple grove was golden green, and the harbor all blue and dimpled and white-capped, the news came about Jem. There had been a trench raid on the Canadian front, a little trench raid so insignificant that it was never even mentioned in the dispatches, and when it was over, Lieutenant James Blythe was reported wounded and missing. "'I think this is even worse than the news of his death would have been,' moaned Rilla through her white lips that night. "'No!' "'No, missing leaves a little hope, Rilla,' urged Gertrude Oliver. "'Yes, torturing, agonized hope that keeps you from ever becoming quite resigned to the worst,' said Rilla. "'Oh, Miss Oliver, must we go for weeks and months not knowing whether Jem is alive or dead? Perhaps we will never know. I—I I cannot bear it. I cannot. Walter, and now Jem. This will kill Mother. Look at her face, Miss Oliver, and you will see that. And Faith, poor Faith, how can she bear it?' Gertrude shivered with pain. She looked up at the pictures hanging over Rilla's desk and felt a sudden hatred of Mona Lisa's endless smile. "'Well, not even this blotted off your face,' she thought savagely. But she said gently, "'No. It will not kill your mother. She's made of finer metal than that. Besides, she refuses to believe Jem is dead. She will cling to hope, and we must all do that. Faith, you may be sure, will do it.' "'I cannot,' moaned Rilla. "'Jem was wounded.' What chance would he have? Even if the Germans found him, we know how they have treated wounded prisoners. I wish I could hope, Miss Oliver. It would help, I suppose. But hope seems dead in me. I can't hope without some reason for it, and there is no reason. When Miss Oliver had gone to her own room and Rilla was lying on her bed in the moonlight, praying desperately for a little strength, Susan stepped in like a gaunt shadow and sat down beside her. Rilla, dear, do not you worry. Little Jem is not dead. Oh, how can you believe that, Susan? Because I know. Listen you to me. When that word came this morning, the first thing I thought of was Dog Monday. And tonight, as soon as I got the supper dishes washed and the bread set, I went down to the station. There was Dog Monday, waiting for the train, just as patient as usual. Now, Rilla, dear, that trench raid was four days ago, last Monday, and I said to the station agent, 
Can you tell me if that dog howled or made any kind of a fuss last Monday night? He thought it over a bit, and then he said, No, he did not. Are you sure? I said. There's more depends on it than you think. Dead sure, he said. I was up all night last Monday night because my mare was sick, and there was never a sound out of him. I would have heard if there had been, for the stable door was open all the time, and his kennel is right across from it. Now, Rilla dear, those were the man's very words, and you know how that poor little dog howled all night after the Battle of Corselet. Yet he did not love Walter as much as he loved Jem. If he mourned for Walter like that, do you suppose he would sleep sound in his kennel the night after Jem had been killed? No, Rilla dear, little Jem is not dead, and that you may tie to. If he were, Dog Monday would have known, just as he knew before, and he would not still be waiting for the trains. It was absurd, and irrational, and impossible. But Rilla believed it for all that, and Mrs. Blythe believed it, and the doctor, though he smiled faintly in pretended derision, felt an odd confidence replace his first despair. And foolish and absurd or not, they all plucked up heart and courage to carry on, just because a faithful little dog at the Glen station was still watching with unbroken faith for his master to come home. Common sense might scorn, incredulity might mutter mere superstition, but in their hearts the folk of Ingleside stood by their belief that Dog Monday knew. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 The Turning of the Tide Susan was very sorrowful when she saw the beautiful old lawn of Ingleside ploughed up that spring and planted with potatoes. Yet she made no protest, even when her beloved peony bed was sacrificed. But when the government passed the daylight saving law, Susan balked. There was a higher power than the Union government, to which Susan owed allegiance. "'Do you think it right to meddle with the arrangements of the Almighty?' she demanded indignantly of the doctor. The doctor, quite unmoved, responded that the law must be observed, and the Ingleside clocks were moved on accordingly. But the doctor had no power over Susan's little alarm. "'I bought that with my own money, Mrs. Dr. Dear,' she said firmly, "'and it shall go on God's time and not Borden's time.' Susan got up and went to bed by God's time, and regulated her own goings and comings by it. She served the meals under protest by Borden's time, and she had to go to church by it, which was the crowning injury. But she said her prayers by her own clock, and fed the hens by it, so that there was always a furtive triumph in her eye when she looked at the doctor. She had got the better of him by so much at least.' "'Whiskers on the moon is very much delighted with this daylight saving business,' she told him one evening. "'Of course he naturally would be, since I understand that the Germans invented it. I hear he came near losing his entire wheat crop lately. Warren Mead's cows broke into the field one day last week. It was the very day the Germans captured the Chemin de Dame, which may have been a coincidence or may not, and were making a fine havoc of it when Mrs. Dick Clough happened to see them from her attic window. At first she had no intention of letting Mr. Pryor know.' She told me she had just gloated over the sight of those cows pasturing on his wheat. She felt it served him exactly right, but presently she reflected that the wheat crop was a matter of great importance, and that save and serve meant that those cows must be routed out as much as it meant anything. So she went down and phoned over to Whiskers about the matter. All the thanks she got was that he said something queer right out to her. She is not prepared to state that it was actually swearing, for you cannot be sure just what you hear over the phone. But she has her own opinion, and so have I. But I will not express it, for here comes Mr. Meredith, and Whiskers is one of his elders, so we must be discreet. "'Are you looking for the new star?' asked Mr. Meredith, joining Miss Oliver and Rilla, who were standing among the blossoming potatoes, gazing skyward. "'Yes, we have found it. See, it is just above the tip of the tallest old pine.' "'It's wonderful to be looking at something that happened three thousand years ago, isn't it?' said Rilla. "'That is when astronomers think the collision took place which produced this new star.' It makes me feel horribly insignificant, she added under her breath. Even this event cannot dwarf into what may be the proper perspective in star systems the fact that Germans are again only one leap from Paris, said Gertrude restlessly. I think I would like to have been an astronomer, said Mr. Meredith dreamily, gazing at the star. There must be a strange pleasure in it, agreed Miss Oliver, an unearthly pleasure in more senses than one. I would like to have a few astronomers for my friends. Fancy talking the gossip of the hosts of heaven, laughed Rilla. "'I wonder if astronomers feel a very deep interest in earthly affairs,' asked the doctor. "'Perhaps students of the canals of Mars would not be so keenly sensitive to the significance of a few yards of trenches lost or won on the western front.' "'I have read somewhere,' said Mr. Meredith, "'that Ernest Renan wrote one of his books during the siege of Paris in 1870, and enjoyed the writing of it very much. I suppose one would call him a philosopher.' "'I have read also,' said Miss Oliver, 
that shortly before his death he said that his only regret in dying was that he must die before he had seen what that extremely interesting young man, the great emperor, would do in his life. If Ernest Renan walked to-day and saw what that interesting young man had done to his beloved France, not to speak of the world, I wonder if his mental detachment would be as complete as it was in 1870. I wonder where Jem is to-night, thought Rilla, in a sudden bitter inrush of remembrance. It was over a month since the news had come about Jem. Nothing had been discovered concerning him, in spite of all efforts. Two or three letters had come from him, written before the trench raid, and since then there had been only unbroken silence. Now the Germans were again at the Marne, pressing nearer and nearer Paris. Now rumours were coming of another Austrian offensive against the Piave line. Rilla turned away from the new star, sick at heart. It was one of the moments when hope and courage failed her utterly, when it seemed impossible to go on even one more day. If only they knew what had happened to Jem. You can face anything you know. But a beleaguerment of fear and doubt and suspense is a hard thing for the morale. Surely, if Jem were alive, some word would have come through. He must be dead. Only, they would never know. They could never be quite sure. And Dog Monday would wait for the train until he died of old age. Monday was only a poor, faithful, rheumatic little dog who knew nothing more of his master's fate than they did. Rilla had a white night and did not fall asleep until late. When she wakened, Gertrude Oliver was sitting at her window, leaning out to meet the silver mystery of the dawn. Her clever, striking profile, with the masses of black hair behind it, came out clearly against the pallid gold of the eastern sky. Rilla remembered Jem's admiration of the curve of Miss Oliver's brow and chin, and she shuddered. Everything that reminded her of Jem was beginning to give intolerable pain. Walter's death had inflicted on her heart a terrible wound. But it had been a clean wound, and it had healed slowly, as such wounds do, though the scar must remain forever. But the torture of Jem's disappearance was another thing. There was a poison in it that kept it from healing. The alternations of hope and despair, the endless watching each day for the letter that never came, that might never come, the newspaper tales of ill-usage of prisoners, the bitter wonder as to Jem's wound, all were increasingly hard to bear. Gertrude Oliver turned her head. There was an odd brilliancy in her eyes. "'Rilla, I've had another dream.' "'Oh, no, no!' cried Rilla, shrinking. Miss Oliver's dreams had always foretold coming disaster. "'Rilla, it was a good dream. Listen. I dreamed just as I did four years ago that I stood on the veranda steps and looked down the glen. And it was still covered by waves that lapped about my feet. But as I looked, the waves began to ebb, and they ebbed as swiftly as four years ago they rolled in, ebbed out and out to the gulf and the glen lay before me, beautiful and green, with a rainbow spanning Rainbow Valley, a rainbow of such splendid color that it dazzled me, and I woke. Rilla! Rilla Blythe! The tide has turned. I wish I could believe it, sighed Rilla. Sooth was my prophecy of fear, believe it when it augurs cheer, quoted Gertrude almost gaily. I tell you, I have no doubt. Yet in spite of the great Italian victory at the Piaf that came a few days later, she had doubt many a time in the hard month that followed. And when, in mid-July, the Germans crossed the Marne again, despair came sickeningly. It was idle, they all felt, to hope that the miracle of the Marne would be repeated. But it was. Again, as in 1914, the tide turned at the Marne. The French and the American troops struck their sudden smashing blow on the exposed flank of the enemy, and with the almost inconceivable rapidity of a dream, the whole aspect of the war changed. The Allies have won two tremendous victories, said the doctor on 20th July. It is the beginning of the end. I feel it. I feel it, said Mrs. Blythe. Thank God, said Susan, folding her trembling old hands. Then she added under her breath, But it won't bring our boys back. Nevertheless, she went out and ran up the flag, for the first time since the fall of Jerusalem. As it caught the breeze and swelled gallantly out above her, Susan lifted her hand and saluted it, as she had seen Shirley do. "'We've all given something to keep you flying,' she said. Four hundred thousand of our boys gone overseas, fifty thousand of them killed. "'But you are worth it.' The wind whipped her grey hair about her face, and the gingham apron that shrouded her from head to foot was cut on lines of economy, not of grace. Yet somehow, just then, Susan made an imposing figure. She was one of the women, courageous, unquailing, patient, heroic, who had made victory possible. In her they all saluted the symbol for which their dearest had fought. Something of this was in the doctor's mind as he watched her from the door. "'Susan,' he said when she turned to come in, "'from first to last of this business you have been a brick.'" End of chapter 30